Now turn, if you would, to Psalm 14. Psalm 14, the book of Psalms is just right in the dead center of the Bible. If you just let it fall open right in the middle. Turn to Psalm 14, and uh, we'll look at a famous verse in verse number 1. The Bible says this in verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Now just turn a few pages over to Psalm 19. You we're in chapter 14, just go to chapter 19. So we saw in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now turn to Acts, if you would. Look at Acts chapter 17 in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. While you're turning there, I'll read you Psalm 97, 6. The heavens declare his righteousness, the Bible says, and all the people see his glory. So we saw in the book of Psalms that only a fool says that there is no God. Because we can look up at the heavens, the Bible says. We can see the glory of God. There's no language or speech where people can't realize that there is a God just from looking at the natural world. The Bible says in Romans 1, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Bible makes it clear that man knows that there's a God. Mankind can see that there's a God. Look at Acts 17, and uh, this is Paul when he's on Mars Hill. He's preaching to the Athenians, and he notices that they're worshiping all these different gods. And it says in verse number 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, and breath, and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. It says that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and move, and have our being, as certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring." The Bible's clear. Mankind knows that there's a God. Now, perhaps a very foolish person would say there is no God. Or perhaps someone could be educated or brainwashed or taught that God is not real. But human nature itself teaches us in our soul and in our heart of hearts, when we look at the world, we can know that there's a God. That's why when we go out soul winning, very rarely do I run into people who just say, there is no God, I believe in the Big Bang, I believe in evolution. Wouldn't you say that's the minority in soul winning? It's true. Now, on TV, on a college campus, it's a different story. But I'm talking about just in America, knocking doors. You know, the vast majority will say, no, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. Now, they ignorantly worship in many cases. They don't know it's salvation. They don't know Jesus Christ. They don't know it's by faith. But they know that there's a God. Human nature itself teaches us that there's a God. Man has a desire to worship God. That's why they built that to the unknown God, that, that shrine that they built. But you see, there are many substitutes for God. There are those who would want to fill that void that people have, where they have a desire to know who God is, and they want to worship God, and they want to look to a higher power. They know that they don't have all the answers, so they want to look to something above them to give them guidance, to lead them, to direct them. It's part of human nature. It's part of who we are as people. But the Bible says this, turn if you would to uh, 2 Corinthians 4. The Bible says this in Exodus 20. This is one of the Ten Commandments. In fact, this is the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. See, God knows that people have a desire to look up to a God and worship a God. And he's saying, it better be the right God. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't worship these poor substitutes for God. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. Uh, 4.4, good night. I'm like, a, I'm like a scientific preacher now. 
2 Corinthians 4.4, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, there's someone who wants to take the place of God, and it's Satan. He said he's the God of this world. He wants to blind the minds of those who don't believe the truth so that they will not worship the true God, that the light of the glorious gospel will not shine and show them that Jesus Christ is that true God in the flesh who dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. See, back all the way in Genesis chapter 3, He approached man in the garden, and He said, "Ye shall not surely die, about how God had told him not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And He said, For God knoweth, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and watch this, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Why was the devil thrown out of heaven in Isaiah chapter 14? Because he said, I will be like the Most High. He wanted to put himself in the place of God. He offered the man in the Garden of Eden, you can be like gods. I'm going to be your God. He said in uh, Luke 4, verse 5, you don't have to turn there. This is when the devil was tempting Jesus. And the devil take them up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. You see, he's always coming to man and telling man, you know, you can be a god with me. You can be like God with me. We will rule the world together. Uh, that's what he's saying to Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Of course, Jesus Christ said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, famous verse. So, quick review. Man knows that there's a God, and the devil is not always going to succeed in convincing people that there's no God. Because it's obvious that there's a God. Therefore, he will try to put something else in the place of God to fill up that void, to fill that God position in their life. He appeals to man's desire to be his own God. It says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, there are many substitutes for God. There are many false gods. There's, there's Allah, so-called, of Islam. There's uh, the God of all these other religions. The God of Mormonism is not the God of the Bible. He's another Jesus. Amen. There are all these other religions and all these fake gods that the Athenians are worshipping, the people are worshipping today. But what I want to talk about today is man trying to become God. Man trying to become God. And the title of the sermon is this, The Government taking the place of God. Now, we live in a day where the government is slowly in America taking the place of God in people's lives. You see, people need somebody to look to. They need somebody to worship and to look up to and, and to give them guidance and to give them rules to live by and do's and don'ts. And our government is teaching children in school that there's no God. Only so that they can set themselves up as a replacement in their life to be their God. I'm going to give you several examples of how the government desires today. And I'm, talking, and I'm not just talking about in general. I'm talking about our government today in the United States of America in April of 2010 desires to be your God. They want to be your God. They don't want you to worship the God of the Bible. He's been banned from school, folks. He's been banned from any federal building. No, they want to take his place and become your God. Let me give you several examples. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. I'll give you the first example. Proverbs chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter number 3, and uh, here's a verse that, that has to do with tithing. Who knows what tithing is? Put up your hand if you know what tithing is. You know, tithing is where the Bible teaches, you know, uh, giving 10% of your increase to the Lord, okay? And it's taught throughout the Bible. Uh, Abraham gave tithes, and all the people in the Old Testament gave tithes. Jesus talked about it. But uh, it's just a, it's not what I'm going to preach about at all. Just, it's a whole other sermon. But you'll notice throughout the Bible that the tithes are often referred to as the first fruits or the firstlings, right? And the reason why is because God always wanted to take the first. Like, let's say they had ten sheep. He wanted the first one. 
Let's say they had, you know, 10 barrels of apples. He wanted the first fruits. The first apples that they picked went to him. Because the Bible says that in all things, he should have the preeminence. Notice the word pre. What does pre mean? You know, before, first. You were supposed to give to God of an offering first. Before you did anything else, you're supposed to give God his first. That's what tithing is all about. It's with the first slings, the first fruits, and, and all that. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse 9. Why is it? Oh, there we go. Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance. It's talking about what you own, what you have. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. Right? So there's one example of where God's telling you to give of the Lord your substance first. Give Him the first fruits. And yet today, turn to James chapter 5. Today, God is not first in America. Because there's somebody else who wants to take a percentage of your money before God even has a chance to take that 10%. Before you even get that in your hand, there's someone else who's taking the preeminence. Look at James chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Watch verse 4, though. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now, what you have to understand about this verse is that the word fraud there is basically what? A deception, a lie? Because if it was just out in the open stealing, that wouldn't be fraud. That's just robbery. That's just stealing. But he said, no, people are working. People are hired. They're laboring. And someone is withholding part of their pay by fraud, through deception, through dishonesty. The word kept back just means withholding. And today the government is withholding a large portion of your income, taking it away. A much bigger percentage than God ever even asked for. That's right. I mean, you want to talk about the Trinity. They take 10% for the Father, 10% for the Son, and 10% for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know, and, and today, Christians today, they're saying, I can't even tithe on that number at the top of the check stub. I don't even see that money. They took away 10%. Now, you know, I understand what you're saying. Now, personally, my, you know, I tithe on the top number. Because I'll tell you something. I'm not going to let the government take preeminence over Amen. Jesus Christ. You know, but, but it's getting to where they take so much. They take so much. They take so much. People are just, you know, how can I even give 10%? I don't even see the 100%. You know, I want personally, I want to give him the preeminence. That's why I always, always have tithed on the original number that I earned before they get a piece of the action, before they took that big chunk out. But today, they, they want to take the place of God. They want to have first dibs on what you owe. Yep. They want to take that percentage of money more than God takes before God even has the chance to take. That's just one example. It's kept back by fraud. Let's look at the next example. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. I'm just going to give you several examples just as we get into the sermon here. Of how our government today is taking the place of God in people's lives. Uh, look, if you would, at uh, Deuteronomy 11, verse 12. Deuteronomy 11, 12 says this, A land which the Lord thy God careth for, the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Don't turn there. I'm going to read you several other verses on the eyes of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Listen to Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Proverbs 5, 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. 1 Peter 3, 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. You see... You remember the song, Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go? Who knows the song? <laughs> oh, be, does anybody know? <laughs> oh, be careful, little feet, where you go? For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, you know, be careful, little hands, what you do. 
Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful. Who knows the song? One, two. Yeah, okay, we got a lot of people. <laughs> All the people grew up in church as a kid, you know. But, you know what? Today, the government wants to take this place and they want to watch you everywhere you go. They want to look at you and see you everywhere you go. Just like God said, I'm watching you. And truly, when you're in your house all by yourself, and you think nobody's around, and you turn on that DVD, you open that magazine, God is looking down on you, no matter where you are. Right. Whither shall I flee from the face of the Lord, David said. He said, if I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. He said, God is everywhere. God's on my prayer. And his eyes run to and fro throughout all the earth. He watches everything you do. He watches everything that you say. And today, our government wants us under surveillance all the time. That's why there's all these cameras everywhere. That there was a thing in the news this week about school children being issued laptops at their yeah. school. I don't know if you heard about this. Yeah. They're given a laptop by the public school, and it was taking pictures of them while they were asleep. It was taking pictures of them in their home, and the people were watching it, and they were saying it's fun. The teachers and principals are watching the children, and they told on a kid for what he was doing wrong. They told his parents, we saw him doing wrong. We saw him doing, you know, we're beholding the evil and the good. Here's another example. Look at Genesis chapter 8. You see, I'm just trying to expose to you this morning what the government's agenda is, and it's really not the government. It's really Satan That's right. through the government. Because, see, Satan is the one who wants to take the place of God. Satan is the one who will recruit men into that army by saying to them, you know, hey, come and be like gods with me. Come rule with me. Come be one of the rulers of the darkness of this world. Come with me, sell your soul to me, and rule with me. Where did I even turn? Genesis, Tell me out. Genesis chapter 8. The other thing is, you know, God is the one who controls the environment. You know, to use their word. God is the one who controls nature. And, and look what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, verse, verse number... Uh, I'm sorry, am I in the wrong... Oh, there we go. Chapter 8. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. While the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Did you get that? He said, as long as this earth exists, there will always be seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, and night. Look at Job chapter 37. If you would, Job chapter number 37. Job chapter number 37. All you have to do is pull a dollar bill out of your pocket. And there's a picture of a pyramid... Okay, which is an evil symbol. Ancient Egypt in the Bible is always referring to Satan and the world. The Bible talks about uh, that city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Egypt represents wickedness in the Bible. And they have that pyramid. And what's at the top of the pyramid on the back of your dollar bill? An eye. The all-seeing eye of Ra, the false god of Egypt. The all-seeing eye watching you everywhere you're going. It's of the devil, my friend. And that's on your government-issued money. Uh, 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 the, the eye watching you. We're going to watch you. Look at the symbol for the, the, the media, the TV station. I just drove by it on the 143 there. CBS, what is it? It's an eye watching you. You say, oh, you're crazy. Well, let's see what the Bible says. Uh, in Job 37, God makes it clear. And in Job 37, 38, 39, uh, all the, I, I'm sorry, Job 38. My mistake. Uh, in Job 38, 39, 40, and 41, God basically explains that He is the one who controls the forces of nature. Look if, look if you would at verse number 28. Hath the rain a father, or who hath begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a, a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or canst thou guide Arturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds that abundance of waters may cover thee? That's why all these satanic religions do the rain dance. Because it's blaspheming this scripture right here. Where God says you cannot through your voice or your dance, make rain come down from the sky. And let me tell you something, the Native Americans are not worshiping God when they're doing that rain dance. And I'm going to tell you, it offends, you say, oh, you're offending their culture. 
The Native American traditional religion is a false religion that's sending people to hell. That's right. It's sending, it has nothing to do with culture. It has to do with a false religion and a false teaching of worshiping the earth. And he says here that uh, you can't, by your voice, make the rain to come out of the clouds, that the abundance of waters may cover thee. Canst thou send lightnings, that they may go and say unto thee, here we are. Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts, or who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom, or who can stay the bottles of heaven? He's saying you can't make it stop raining. When the dust groweth into hardness, and the clods cleave fast together, wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion, or fill the appetite of the young lion? And on and on he goes for four chapters. And I, I encourage you, read these chapters. These are some of the most beautiful, powerful chapters in the Bible. Job 38 through 41. Great passage. But it's all about how God is the one who feeds the wild goats. God is the one who makes the rain come down. God is the one who makes the sun come up every day and go down every day. God is the one, he said, in him we have our being, by him all things consist. What is holding together the atom? The power of God. What keeps the earth in orbit? The power of God. What keeps the earth tilted on its axis? God. God is in control of the natural world and the universe. And yet today, we're being taught that the government must control. The government must preserve the environment. The government must keep us uh, on a right ecosystem. Listen to this. This is from my niece. So just a quick review, though. How is the government trying to play God? Well, number one, they want to surveil you. They want to watch you. That's why you see cameras popping up everywhere. That's why you have in America today warrantless wiretapping of all cell phones, all landlines. They can be tapped for any reason, right. without a warrant, no judge. Just warrantless wiretapping, surveillance of Americans, uh, snooping through their emails. It's all law. It's all out in the you know, conspiracy theories. It's in the open. It's, uh, it's right. law. It's a fact. Because they want to be God. They want to watch you. They want to know everything about you. They want the hairs of your head to be numbered by them. Yeah. It's, it's a demented man who wants to be God. That's the type of people that we're dealing with. And they're working for the devil. Not only that, they want, they want to take your tithe. They want to take the tribe. You know, like a triple tithe. Not only that, they want to control the forces of nature. They want to step in and say, we're the ones who will preserve this environment. We're the ones who will make it rain at the right time. We're the ones that will make you be able to plant seeds and things will grow. We will take over nature. This is my niece. My niece lives in Fort Worth, Texas, which is considered the Bible Belt. Okay, But she is seven years old. Okay, She is exactly the age of Isaac. Isaac, stand up. She's the exact age of Isaac. She's like a few weeks different than Isaac. So just to give you an idea of my niece, Erica. This is a letter that she was given home from school a couple days ago. The government school, by the way. Mrs. Starnes. Erica shared with me today that she doesn't recycle. Okay, this is written to my sister. <laughs> Erica shared with me today that she doesn't recycle and thinks that Earth Day is a bad day. <laughs> okay, this is... Because I... It was Earth Day, apparently, this week. I explained that Earth Day is a day for us to conserve our resources and think of different ways to protect the plants and animals of the world. I also explained that it is not taught as a religious holiday in any way. In addition, it is also part of a first grade science curriculum to learn about conservation of Earth's natural resources. This concept is also taught in other grades as well. Thank you, Mrs. Din. Now, this is why, because she was given a handout, and it said this. Why should we recycle? I don't recycle. It said, what? She said, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. I wish I would have brought the paper that Erica filled out. But it basically said, uh, you know, what do you love about the earth? That's what it was. Thank you. What do we love about the earth? And she said, I don't love the earth. Now, it's amazing to me that she is being forced to love something that she doesn't love. You know, not only just teaching you facts and knowledge, but no, you will love what we tell you to love. She was basically got a note home and in trouble because she would not celebrate Earth Day. She would not say, I love Mother Earth, and I recycle. She said, I don't want to recycle. I don't care about the Earth. Okay? Now listen to this. This is my sister's response. Mrs. Din, I agree with Erica and support her on this. Calling the Earth Mother Earth implies that we evolved. Earth is a tool used by liberal environmentalists to brainwash children. 
Of course we are against extreme negligence such as polluting the water, but no, we do not separate our cans from other trash. <laughs> as fundamental Christians, we do not believe the earth will be around forever. Amen. That's right. It's not going to be here forever. I realize the curriculum overemphasizes conservation. However, I do not understand why you feel the need to force Erica to agree with your political views. Amen. I have two other children in the public school system, so I am well aware of what is taught in other grades. In fact, I have found the other teachers to be more tolerant of cultural diversity. <laughs> I was raised to believe the Bible and have taught my children the truth. If you would like more information on the Christian faith, I would be happy to discuss it with you. Our political views naturally correspond with our religious beliefs. We are against abortion, socialized health care, and big government. We own guns. We think... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, this, is, this isn't me. This is what my sister wrote to the, to the principal. Or to the teacher. She, taught, she, she gave a CC to the principal of the school, too. We think Ron Paul would have been a great president. There are teachers at Creekview Middle School who feel the same and do not recycle either. Since you seem to be so politically correct, I find it hard to understand your intolerance of a child expressing a different viewpoint, right? Yeah, Since yeah. everybody's opinion's okay, and everybody can have their own view, and nobody's wrong, just yeah. choose the best answer on the test. How about choose the right answer? But it's all a brain of choose the best answer. Yeah. You know, nobody's wrong. Nobody gets a... They don't get A's and B's and F's and, and detention. They get a color change. If they do, wrong, if they do something wrong. It's not really wrong. They just get a color change. Erica's like, I was afraid I was going to get a color change over this. <laughs> Whatever that means. I don't know what that means. Well, I don't like you're hurting my daughter's self-esteem by telling the class that Fatima is the best student. I don't know, that was some, some other beef that she had. <laughs> hey, I have older children, so I know it gets better over time. Hopefully so will your teaching ability, for the sake of your future students, Ronnie. You know, but it, look, it's amazing. The same teacher who played her in that aerobics video I talked about a few weeks ago with the flaming side of You know, just cramming it down their throat. Not enough that they teach it to them for hours, but then when they give them the thing to fill out a worksheet on it, and she says, no, I don't love the earth. The earth is not my mother. I don't recycle. I don't care. No, you know, you're getting a note home. You will participate. You will be an environmentalist. You will be a leftist. You will be a socialist. That's what's going on today. Right. Because the, the first verse that I read you, if you turn to Isaiah 54, this is where we started the sermon. Isaiah chapter 54. And this is where we read that great, fantastic chapter from the Bible about God and uh, the blessings that He would give to those who love God and who worship God and who are righteous. He said in verse 13, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. Did you get that? All thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near to thee. You see, when you're righteous, when you serve God, your children are taught of the Lord, and you do the right things, the Bible makes it clear that you'll not be oppressed. You'll not be a slave. You won't live in fear. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Who's the one person we're supposed to fear? God. God. Amen. Every time fear is mentioned from Genesis to Revelation, it's always negative, unless it's talking about fearing God. Because God is the one person we're supposed to fear. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The only thing, we don't fear evil, we fear God. That's all. We shouldn't be, because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We should fear God alone. One of the founding fathers, I believe it was Thomas Jefferson, said, when the people fear the government, you have tyranny. When the government fears the people, you have liberty. It's a great quote. Amen. Because, see, the government wants to take the place of God. They want to teach your children. When the Bible says they should be taught of the Lord, the Bible says they should be brought up by their parents in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's talking to the parent. That's talking to dad. That's talking to mom. But the government wants to step in and say, no, we will watch you when you're sleeping. We will watch you as you go about your daily life. 
We will take the first fruits. We will take the first of your flock. We will take the first of the fruits of your labor. We will withhold from your check before you even have a chance to give your tithe to God. We will take that away from you. We will uh, preserve the environment. We will make sure the animals are fed. We will make sure that the crops grow and that the plants and the ecosystem and all this stuff. Uh, the government wants to take the place of God. But here's a very chilling way that the government wants to take the place of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. You know, I mean, I, this sermon could be like five hours long, but I'm just giving you a few examples. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews chapter... <laughs> well, you're the only one. No, <laughs> just kidding. Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Now, now I'm going to bring up a real controversial subject right now, but, you know, this shouldn't be controversial. And I'm going to prove what I believe from the Bible about this. You see, the government is on a power trip. Is, is the, you know, let me, you say, what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm having trouble understanding this sermon. The government is on a power grab. They're on a power trip. Yep. And, you know, you say, why are you preaching about this so much lately? Because it's changing every day. Right, I mean, yep. just this That's week right. they passed this legislation now where the cops can pull you over and just ask you for your papers. Yep. Yep. You know, I, I better make sure I don't get a tan. You know, because if you're a little brown, that's where you're getting pulled over now. And you have to show your papers. You say, they're not going to do that. It already happened two days ago. A trucker was pulled over and they arrested him and took him to jail because he didn't have his birth certificate in the cab of his commercial truck. He's a citizen. He was born in Fresno, California. That's the society we're living in today. You say, oh, why are you so mad about this? Because a year ago, they beat me up at one of these border check things. And it was, it was 75 miles from, or it was 50 some miles from the border. It wasn't crossing a border. Just traveling in the United States. I was beaten and thrown in jail for not showing my papers. It's the same thing. This is happening, folks. That's Wake right. up. And I'm, gonna, I'm just explaining this morning why it's happening. Because the government is teaching that there's no God for a reason. Because they want to fill that void. Right. They want to fill that gap. Before I get into my controversial point from Hebrews 11, let me give you another point. People today think that because something is legal, that makes it morally right. Yep. Yep. And that if something is illegal, that makes it morally wrong. So God has been replaced as the lawgiver yep. by the government. <clears throat> get this. Yep. I was saying to someone about the evils of abortion, and they said, but abortion's legal. It's not legal in God's laws. Amen. 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 It doesn't matter whether something's legal. Just because the government gives you permission to do something doesn't make it That's right. right. That's right. Amen. That's right. You know, the government says you can drink when you're 21, but let me tell you something. Kids that are 18, 19, 20, when you turn 21, why don't you open that book and see what God says about drinking Amen. and not Amen. let the government tell you, oh, today you can drink now. Today you can gamble now. Now you can smoke cigarettes. Now you can take drugs because the doctor wrote it out and said you may take drugs. And he's just an agent of the government. Yep. Let me tell you something. Just because a doctor writes down, take this drug, that doesn't mean that that drug is right to take. Amen. Many of the drugs that are being prescribed are hardcore narcotics yep. that are just like what's being sold by the dope dealer on the street, but the only difference is that one's legal and one's not. Yep. And people think that any drug that's legal is okay to take. That's what they think. Yep. You know what I'm saying is true. Right. You know right. that 99% of Baptists will tell you that if a drug is legal, it's okay to take that drug, as long as the doctor said yes. I'm talking about mind-altering drugs, psychiatric drugs, and all these different things. Hey, I'm glad that God gave me the spirit of a sound mind. I don't need a drug to make me sane. Amen. You're sitting there saying, yes, you do. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't need a drug. <laughs> I don't need a drug to make me sane. This book will give you the sound mind. Get in God's Word. I talked to, there was a girl who went to our church when we first started uh, the church. And her mother said she's on all these psychiatric drugs and everything like that. And, and she's, she's, uh, she can't get, I, I said, you know, you need to get off those drugs. I said that, you know, you shouldn't be on that stuff. And she got upset and all this stuff. I said, I promise you that, 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 that your, your daughter is having problems because of something else. She just needs to get saved and get right with God and whatever. You know, she's blasting her nine-inch nails, Marilyn Manson. She's listening to all this satanic music. And she's taking drugs. She's taking psychiatric drugs. She's taking street drugs. I told her, I said, you're probably demon-possessed. You know, you're here because she's talking about hearing all these voices and all. You're demon-possessed. You're taking a bunch of drugs. You're listening to a bunch of satanic music. That's what's wrong with you. But today, if the government allows it, it's okay. 
You know, abortion's okay, drugs are okay, drinking's okay, but oh, don't smoke marijuana, you know. And by the way, I'm just as against marijuana, it's wicked. Amen. But they'll say, well, marijuana's wicked, but drinking's fine. Can somebody explain to me the difference? <laughs> People die drinking. People OD on drinking. If you drink too much, you'll die. It's true. Yeah. If you drink too much, you'll go to the hospital. I mean... It's the same stuff, but one's legal, one's not. That's where people get our morality. My morality comes from the Bible. It says, Amen. be sober, I'm going to be sober. Amen. That's an absence of drugs, an absence of alcohol on any level. And I'm not talking about legitimate medicines. I'm talking about mind-altering drugs and narcotics, okay? <coughs> that are being prescribed or street drugs. It's wicked as a devil. Amen. You ought to flee from it. It's, it's bad. But today, they've become the lawgiver. If you do something against the law, let me explain something to you. Did you know that soul winning in Tempe is illegal? Did you know that? Now in Phoenix it's legal, in Chandler it's legal, in Mesa it's legal. But in Tempe, where you're sitting right now, you're sitting in Tempe, it is illegal for me to walk across the street and knock on that door and leave an invitation to church and give the gospel. But you know what, do you think I care? Because I don't. Because we've knocked Amen. half the doors in Tempe and we're going to knock the other half. Amen. And we've knocked you know, more doors in other cities. But the point is that the government should not dictate our morality. The Bible should dictate our morality. It doesn't matter whether the government's what God is the one who's watching over us everywhere we go. He's the one who needs to know about us. He's the one who gets my first fruits. He's the one who I give the firstlings of my business, who I give my tithe to before the government comes and, and withholds more of it by fraud. But not only this. Here's a, here's a, like I said, this is kind of a controversial issue, but it ought not be because it's so cut and dry. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. The Bible says this. And I'm just trying to show you what's going on today with our government, how they're on this power trip, how they're out of control, they're taking over, they have a God complex, they think they're God, they want to run our lives, they want to take away our freedom and liberty that God gave us. Thank God that God gave us free will. Amen. Thank God, but I wish that uh, man would give us freedom. But he says in uh, Hebrews 11.32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah. Boy, great men, great stories. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. I mean, read the book of Judges. Powerful stories. And today, people are filling their mind with video games and movies. This is where the action is, right here. Get in this book. You'll, you'll enjoy it. And uh, just, I mean, look at the great stories this year. Barak, not the Barak you're thinking of, uh, Gideon, Barak, Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel of the prophets, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed violent in, valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now you say, what's the significance of this passage, Pastor Anderson? This is what's significant about this passage. This is the only time in the entire Bible that the word torture is ever mentioned. Did you know that? It's the only time. The only time in the entire Bible, Genesis Revelation, that the word torture is mentioned. And what does it say? Verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So who's being tortured here, the good guys or the bad guys? The good guys. The good guys. Now there's another word in the Bible that's similar to torture. Who knows what it is? Help me out. There's a synonym for torture in the Bible. Who knows? It starts with a T. It starts with a T-O. <laughs> Brett gets the prize, he gets to go go-kart racing. No, <laughs> Did you learn the verses? No. You're not going to go-kart racing. <laughs> torment, right? Torment is the other word that the Bible uses for torture. Okay, that means the same thing. This is the only time torture is mentioned. Notice what it says at the end of verse 37. You'll see that word again. Tormented. About the same group of people, right? 
They were uh, destitute, afflicted, tormented. Now, it's interesting because the word torment is used throughout the Bible. Guess who is the one doing the tormenting every time the word torment is mentioned besides this passage? God. Let me give you some examples. Luke 16, 24. You don't have to turn there. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, you turn to Revelation 14. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Where is that guy at where he's being tormented? In hell. And all throughout the Bible, you'll see the word torment. It's always God tormenting people in hell. That's what the word torment is used. It's also used during the tribula or after the tribulation when he's pouring out his wrath and those, uh, those uh, scorpion-like uh, locusts that are, that are stinging people, and it says they torment men for five months. Look at Revelation 14, 11. It says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And by the way, hell's eternal. That's right. It says here, And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So all throughout the Bible, you have this concept of torment, and it's always God being the one who punishes man by tormenting him in hell. Right? All throughout the Bible. You have one mention of torture, one mention of torment in Hebrews chapter 11, where it's man tormenting man. A man torturing another man. And it's wicked, evil That's people. Right. Amen torturing the good guys. That's what it says. That's the only time it's mentioned. Now, you've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which are God's laws for the nation of Israel. Never one time is there any torture mentioned. Never does he say to torture someone. Never does he say to do uh, you know, cruel and unusual punishment. It's basically, these are the way that God punished criminals. Either they had to pay a financial fine, or they had to be, uh, get a beating. But see, it wasn't torture. It was a punishment. There's a difference between torture and punishment. Yeah. He would give him a punishment, a physical beating, and he put a limit on it. He said, no more than, than 40 stripes. That's right. He said, otherwise, you will seem vile to your brother. If you were to beat someone more than 40 times, you're a sick person. You know, you're taking it too far, and so forth. So people who did very bad crimes would get a beating, but it was totally public. They'd be tied up with their hands like this. And they'd be, you know, beaten 40 times, max. The other punishment was death, which is death by stoning. Okay? But today, in the United States of America, our government thinks that it's okay to torture people. And I'm talking about days and weeks. Yeah. And more. I'm not talking about 39 swats because they did a crime, because they were convicted in court, yeah. like the Bible says, where they have a trial, and they're convicted by the judges and sentenced to a beating. No. I'm talking about people for days or weeks or months being tortured in a secret location. And this is public news. Yep. They're tortured uh, for months and months to get them to talk. It's wicked. It is wicked. And I'm going to show you in the Bible it's wicked. But first, let me just read for you the laws of the land. Because even if it were not wicked, it's against the law. And yet they do it. Yet they brag about doing it. They say they do it. They say it's okay. Listen to this. This is the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This is from the Bill of Rights. It's very clear. It says, excessive bail shall not be required. This is what America used to be. Nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Did you get that? No cruel and unusual punishments shall be inflicted. Now, that's very clear. Eighth Amendment, Constitution. That's the law. That's the highest law in the land. Listen to this from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Did you get that? Who gives us our rights according to the founding document of our country? God, the Creator. He gives us rights. It can't be taken away from us. They're inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now, who does that say, according to our laws? I mean, these are our founding document, our laws, our bill of what? 
Who gives us those rights? And who did God give them to? All men. That's what it says in our founding document. You say, well, that's not the Bible. No, it's not the Bible, but it is the law of our land. It is the law of our country. And here's what you hear people say today. Well, we're not going to give our rights to our enemies. Or we're not going to give rights to immigrants. You know, illegal immigrants. Undocumented, whatever. They say, we're not going to give our rights to these illegals or to, to Muslims or to people in other countries. Well, hold on a second. We don't have the right to give people rights anyway. That's right. Where did this document that founded our country say the government gives us our rights? No, it said the Creator gave us the right, right. to live. I have the right to be alive and to be free and to pursue happiness given to me by God. The government doesn't give me the right to freedom of speech. I already have the right to freedom of speech. When I was born, the first thing I did was go, ah! When that doctor slapped me on the behind. And I've been screaming ever since. And nobody can stop me because God's the one who gave me the right to do it. From saying dad, dad, to saying what I'm saying today. I didn't get permission to speak. I don't need permission to be alive. God gave me those rights. And God didn't just give them to you because you're an American. God gave them to every human That's being. Right. Amen. And they're enumerated in the Bill of Rights. And, the, and the, the Bill of Rights says that cruel and unusual punishments shall not be inflicted. And yet today, torture... Look, now, let's, let's go to the Bible. Let's see what you say. Well, what do we do? What should we do? Look at 1 Samuel 30. You say, well, how do we deal with these enemies of our country, though? Yeah. That we're torturing. You know, we have to torture them. Now, first of all, everybody knows that torture does not work as a method of getting information from people. Because have you ever been tortured? You'll say anything to end the torture. That's right. So you'll make stuff up. Good one. But you see, it's sick people who enjoy torture. Yeah. Who like to torture people. You, you, you say, what, what kind of tortures are they doing? I'm not going to go into the graphic tortures just for sake of children. Because I don't want to just sit here and dwell upon all this and go at it, but it's, there's a lot of really sick, horrible yeah. things that they've done, that, that they've done on the record. But even if we don't go into that, let's just go into the big one that everybody knows about, waterboarding. Okay? There was a conservative talk radio host in Chicago who said, waterboarding's not torture. He said, I'll be waterboarded. He said, I can last, he said, I'll last for at least 30 seconds. Now, first of all, 30 seconds isn't that long. <laughs> He lasted for eight seconds, and he said, it's, he said, I don't want to admit this, but it's torture. He said, that's the most horrible experience I've ever had in my life. He said, I felt like I was dying. He said, if I would have known how bad it was, I never would have done it. And it only lasted eight seconds. And our government has on the record waterboarded the same people as many as 175 times in a row. 175 times in a row. This guy said, I don't want to admit it. It goes against my political beliefs. But he said, it's torture, it's horrendous. He said, it's instant torture. He said, it's the most horrible feeling I've ever had in my life. Who saw, who saw him say that? Yeah, a couple of people. Two people. And so we have a government that is now degenerating to the point of the Soviet Union. Yep. Who tortured millions of people. That's where our country... And you say, oh, I trust our government. <laughs> okay, do you like the way they're handling the money? Do you like the way they're running our country? But, but I'm sure they're only torturing the right people. I'm sure you can trust them to, to be torturing people on an island somewhere that you've never seen or know anything about, that all those people are guilty. Who Obama himself said, the, we don't have enough evidence to convict these people, so we don't know what to do with them. Now that he's out of campaign mode, he said, well, we don't have the evidence to convict these people, and so we can't turn, but we can't turn them loose because they're dangerous, but we can't really prove that they did anything wrong so we're just going to have to have indefinite detention. You know, and they're still being imprisoned with no trial, no evidence, whatever. Look at what God teaches here in the Bible. Because uh, let me teach you something. All the answers are in the Bible. Amen. Mm -hmm. I hate it when people say the Bible doesn't deal with that subject. The Bible deals with every subject. And, people, and, and did you know that Christians today, if people go to church, there was a poll taken in the United States, 60% of people who go to church think torture is okay. Yep. <clears throat> 40% of people who don't go to church think torture is okay. So basically, you know, you're 20% more likely to think torture is okay if you go to church. 
Unbelievable. You didn't get that from the Bible, my friend, that the government should be torturing people. It's wrong, it's sinful, it's wicked. And you know, in a sense, I've been tortured. You know, it wasn't for a very long, but I was totally not doing anything, and they, just to punish me, they tortured me with that taser for 20 seconds straight. It was torture. I mean, it was, it was, that's the only way to describe it. I felt like I was burning in hell. I mean, it was bad. Not that I know what that feels like, but that's what I imagined as I was writhing with somebody stomping on my head into broken glass, and I'm writhing being uh, electrocuted with 50,000 volts for 20 seconds straight. Count to 20 slow. It's a long time. It's torture. No judge, no jury. I was, charges against me were dropped. I didn't commit any crime. According to a court of law, I didn't commit any crime. Yet, torture. Uh, and thank God it was only for a, a short time. But look if you would at uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 1. The, all the answers are in the Bible. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the power the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. So let me give you this story. David here, he has all of his family, his men, their families, everything like that. They went out with the Philistines. And while they were gone... Their camp was attacked by enemies, by the Amalekites, who kidnapped their families, stole all their goods, took their wives and children captive. They get back, their wife's gone, their children are gone, all their stuff is gone, and they're weeping, they're crying, they're angry. The people even spake of stoning David, because they blamed him. So they're upset. So now they want to go after the people who did this. They want to try to see if they can get their wives and children back, see if they can uh, get some vengeance. Look at verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs, and two clusters of raisins, and when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me, because three days gone I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. So here's a man who was one of the people who attacked. This is one of the enemies that came in and, and kidnapped and stole and, and, and uh, attacked them. So this is the enemy that they found, okay? Look what it says. And David said unto him, uh, this man, and then verse 15, David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. So here's an enemy combatant. Is he tortured? Let's torture him. And he'll tell us what we know, what we want to know. No, he just said he, they fed him, they took care of him, they gave him something to drink, they treated him nicely, and then they just said, can you give us the information we want? We won't kill you. We'll, we'll take care of you. We'll protect you if you give us the information. And he gave him the information. But you'll not find any example of people being tortured in the Bible unless they're God's people being tortured, being sawn asunder, being tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Who was the big torturer all throughout the Dark Ages? The Roman Catholic Church torturing people? It's true. It's, it's a part of history. The Soviet Union tortured. And now there are Christians today in America that wants to give our government the right to torture. Even though it's against the law, even though it's against the Bible. Why do they want to torture people? Because they think they're God. Because God is the only one who torments anyone in the entire Bible. He torments them in hell. That's where they're going to get what they deserve someday. In hell. In hell. You say, well, you just can't let people get away. No one gets away with anything. God is the judge. It's not man's job to torture another man. To torture someone else. And every government in history that's ever tortured <coughs> always ended up torturing their own people. That's right. It's a fact. China, Russia, you name it. 
There are a lot of other points I have. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna go. I'll just. I'll just kind of read off a few of the points. You know, basically, you're supposed to rely upon God to take care of you. You know, the government says we'll th we will be the ones to take it. Trust us to take care of you. We will be the one to fall back on when you're on hard times instead of relying on the Lord and the local church to take care. That was a whole other point. Uh, so many other things that the government in China today dictates a one-child policy when the Bible says that God is the one who opens and closes the womb. An abusive government wants to tell you how many children you can or cannot have. Communist China today is an example of that. And we could go on and on, but let me just wrap it up in a nutshell for you. We're living in perilous times. And it's time for God's people to say, you know what, I have one master, one authority, it's God's word, he's the only God I worship, I'm not going to fall into the trap of worshiping the government, whatever they say, I just believe it and go along with it, I think they can do no wrong. Hey look, everything God does is right, he never makes a mistake. Amen. There's nobody in hell who doesn't belong there right now, my friend. Did you hear me? That's right. Every single person in hell right now belongs there or they wouldn't be there. But then we think the same thing about the government. Well, everybody who's being tortured belongs there. Everybody who's in jail belongs in jail. Right? Ken Oven, you know? Everybody, everybody who, uh, who's in jail, everybody who's tortured belongs there. Everybody that we kill over in the war in Iraq all deserves to be killed. Even if they're a pregnant woman, even if they're, you know, children, civilians, it's okay, you know, our government knows what they're doing. They can do no wrong. Look, look what they're doing in our country. And then you think everything they're doing over there is okay? God, help us. Look what they do to us. And we're living in perilous times. It's time for God's people to wake up and say, look, the government is not our God. We're not going to give them the power of God. We're going to worship God. Him only will we serve. We're not going to tell, let them tell us where we're going to go soul winning and where we're not going to go soul winning. You say, I'm not sure if some of the way you preach is like when you preach against homosexuality. I'm not sure that's legal. I'm not sure if it's legal either, and frankly, I don't care. Amen. 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 It's the Bible. Yeah, that's right. And today we have pastors, Christians, bowing down to the government saying, the government's going to take care of me. The government can do no wrong. We'll let the government decide who they torture and who they kill. Oh, we just trust the government. We trust them. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the government with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge them, and they shall direct your path. But that's the way a lot of Christians think. And we need a major paradigm shift in America among Christians. We need God's people to get their mind out of talk radio, to get their mind out of Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and all their little heroes and Glenn Beck, to get their mind out of all this garbage and get their mind in this book. Amen. And say, what does the Bible say? Instead of just, oh yeah, yeah, we need to be torturing those people. They're bad. Let's torture them. Yeah, let's water, let's drown them. Let's torture them. But you didn't find that in the Bible. That's right. Yeah, I think all these cameras are great. They can watch us all the time. They can watch us when we go to bed and when we get up in the morning. They can watch me through my bedroom window. It's a sick world we're living in. Oh, yeah, and then they say this. And by the way, here's one more verse for you. You say, you don't preach the Bible. I preach three pages of Bible verses, and that's a lot more than you'll hear at the Baptist church down the street. It just wasn't the verses that you liked. <laughs> but it was three pages of Bible verses that I read for you. And that's a lot more you'll hear at the Baptist church down the street. Now I forgot my other point. It's too busy to talk about that. <laughs> We're not going anyway until I remember this. <laughs> no, we're not torturing anybody. Oh. You're not even listening. <laughs> oh, it drives me nuts. This was the this was the crowning. This was the the last nail in the coffin. This was the the icing on the what was it? Oh yeah. How about this? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Did you hear that? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, do you want to be pulled over and asked to show your papers? Because you're white, so you don't care. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm white, so this doesn't affect me, the stinking Mexicans. But hold on a second. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Because, and there's a reason why. 
He said, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. I'll tell you why. Because what you do is going to come back around to you, and you will reap what you've sown. And today you say, torturing Muslims? So what? Torture them. But hold on a second. Tomorrow it'll be you. Oh yeah, who cares? Some Mexican truck driver. He doesn't speak English that good or whatever. Hey, he spoke English fluently and he's born in America, yeah. but he's Mexican. And he got thrown in jail. But that doesn't matter, right? You know, because it's never gonna happen to you, but it will happen to you. And you better stop and say, you know, well, it doesn't matter that it's that it's, you know, they're persecuting this minority, that's them. It doesn't affect me, but tomorrow will affect you. Yeah. Today it's Mexicans. You know, it was Japanese people put in concentration camps in World War II in America. Japanese internment camps. It was the Japanese, it's the Mexicans, it's the Muslims being tortured. They're killing innocent people in Iraq. Nobody cares because it's just so far away, you know, who cares? But you know what? They're bringing that same stuff back here to use right. it on us. They're practicing over there for taking over this country. It's a fact. And you know what? We deserve it as America because we think it's okay to go over there and kill a million people. I looked at a website that was trying to tone down how many people have died in Iraq. This was a website that was actually trying to say we haven't killed as many people as people are saying. And they were given the conservative numbers and it was like soldiers killed in Iraq, 30,000. Civilians was like 850,000 civilians dead in Iraq. And then our soldiers is like 5,000 between Iraq and Afghanistan combined. You know, and I've seen video footage of them killing civilians, of killing innocent people. Mm -hmm. Just a guy just walking down the street with a camera. And they're like, oh, that looks like a gun. Boom. Then the guy's crawling yeah. on the pavement trying to get help. And a, a vehicle comes out, and a bunch of unarmed people get out and try to help the guy. Two, two teenage girls and a bunch of men try to help the guy, and they just blew them all up. Yep. And the video was, was, was leaked by somebody. And, and then one of the guys who was actually there said, oh, this video just shows what happens every day in this That's war. Right. Yep. And let me tell you something. And this is controversial too, but I don't care. This is America. I'm an American. I can say this. I'll tell you right now, you know what those Iraqis are doing over there right now? The exact same thing that we're going to be doing when we have foreign troops in our country yep, killing right. innocent people and killing our family members. Right. We'll do the same thing they're doing. That's right. Yep. We have no right to be occupying a foreign country killing innocent people. And you can say, I don't want to hear this in church. Where are you going to hear it? On CNN? Fox News? Go ahead and believe the lies and be part of something that's wicked. But I'm going to expose it to you because I'm a preacher of God's word. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. The Bible says that John the Baptist preached and told soldiers, he said, don't do any violence to anyone. And he wasn't telling them not to fight a war. There's nothing wrong with fighting a legitimate war on a battlefield against soldiers. But when you're killing women and children, that's wrong. That's right. The Bible says it's wrong. The Bible teaches it's wrong in Deuteronomy. teaches it's wrong in the book of Luke chapter 3. It teaches throughout the Bible, you don't kill civilians and innocent people. You don't bomb cities and kill innocent people. It's wrong. And you say, well, how are we going to be safe, though? We've got to do that to keep us safe. Well, you didn't listen then when I first read the chapter before I even started preaching Isaiah 54. Because God gives you a plan for being right. He said in Isaiah 54, 14, In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. For thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. If you do right, he said. Then in verse 17 he said, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I don't care whether you like this kind of preaching or not. I'm going to preach it. It's Bible. He said, If you're righteous, He'll protect you from the terrorists. Amen. If you're righteous, He'll protect you from being attacked. If you're righteous, no weapon against you will be formable prosper. If you're righteous, you'll be safe and you'll prosper. And
and he'll take care of you. But if you're wicked and evil, he said, judgment is coming. That's right. That's and judgment's right. coming on America because of our wickedness and evil. We are killing innocent people in Iraq. We are kidding. You say, I don't believe that. You're un-American. Are you going to deny that there's 3,000 babies being killed in this country every day? Since you don't care about all those brown people in Iraq, do you care that they're killing babies with your tax dollars? On April 15th, you wrote your check to help kill babies through Planned Parenthood, funded by the government to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. It's a fact. John McCain said he wanted to keep on giving hundreds of millions. He said, if I'm like friends, I'll keep giving the hundreds of millions to Planned Parenthood. Obama signed an executive order sending money to abortionists in Africa to kill black babies in Africa. But no, our government would never kill anybody that's wrong, right? They'll kill babies. Are you going to say that they're not killing 3,000 babies? 